with us. You may be seated and make sure to tell your neighbor how good they're looking today. Good morning everyone. How are you doing? Good to see you all. Good to be in worship with you all. No sin, no shame, right? You know, we come into, we come into church without condemnation, but celebration, right? When we come back to the Lord, it's, it's not because of condemnation and He doesn't condemn us, but He celebrates. There's a celebration with the Lord and unto the Lord. And, and we should, I, we believe that church should be enjoyed and not endured. You remember the, you remember, you remember the church that you had to endure and you, you, you must be sanctified and saved if you endured that service. And so every day, every week, you had to go remind yourself, yep, I'm saved, I made it through that, that church service. Uh, I'm sorry, I may be touching on some hearts and y'all aren't ready for that. Ooh, I hope you make it through this. We're going to have fun. If I see you leaving, it's because you want to be endured, not enjoyed. All right, so <laughs> we have tribe sign sign up. By the way, you see, that, you see that smoker out there? We've got some smoked sausage for you guys after, after church. If you'll stop through there, and we have those little, little desks there, kiosks, and that's where your Thrive Tribe leaders it is, we, we strongly believe in finding freedom, and as part of our, our vision statement, we hope that everyone that comes through here discovers, finds freedom, and their heart really is changed for the kingdom of God, and their perspective, the smudge of yesterdays are removed, and some of the guilt and the, the shame uh, from the sins past are truly removed, not just 
you know, I can deal with it because I'm saved now, but truly removed from your life and stop, they stop controlling your life. So uh, when we talk about finding freedom, Thrive Tribes is a major avenue for you that we use to get you into small groups, to get you growing in one of many subjects so that you can begin to move along your spiritual journey, your next steps of life, with others who are also going through their next steps of life because we're all on a spiritual journey. Uh, I'm going to show you in a moment that we're, we're all on a spiritual journey. We're all moving somewhere, and we're all going in a direction. Some of us may be, may be just plateaued, sitting down in a pew-like lifestyle, and we're not really going anywhere. We're just kind of hunkered in. But I want to I want to light a fire under you through this series and even today to wake you back up and put some put some life back in you so that you can move further along in your journey. So that's why we have Thrive Tribes. You, we need people. My the, my greatest growth in my life, my spiritual journey happened with a small group of friends. And so even now, I want to make sure I keep a small group of friends around me that are actually going to challenge me and grow. They're they're wanting to mature. And so I want to keep people like that around me so that we can challenge each other in our next steps of life. And that's what Thrive Tribes does for you. But I, I, you, I see some of you already have your phone out. And so that's great. You're in a great place. I actually want you to get your phone out. And in church, yes, your pastor is asking you to get your phone out because I want to show you a new app that we use so that you can actually always track with us and get stay plugged in and get plugged in. It's called the Church Center app. You download that. We have a, a version of our own. I, I've already downloaded it, so I'm opening it. You find Thrive Community Church, which is probably the, the greatest church on all this in this app. And then, <laughs> and then go in this church. You're going to click next. You're going to put your phone number in there. They're going to send you a code. You copy that code and pl- paste it in this app just like this right here. That was where it came from for me. And I'm copying and pasting and putting it in there, and then it opens you up to our Church Center app where you can then discover different things that we have going on throughout the year, throughout the weeks uh, up, up and coming, the months, and it's going to show you groups, it's going to show you events, and groups is where you're going to find Thrive Tribes, and events is where you're going to find a way for you to reg- register for our next steps, which we do the second and fourth weekend during the 1045 service of every month right now there's a next steps going on in our cafe thrive cafe where people are growing and understanding what it is to have next steps who who thrive community church is where we came from but then where we're going the vision and then also their spiritual gifts each individual's spiritual gifts and their personality and so you can even have check-ins if you have parents parents you have kids I'm on the way. I'm late, but I want to check my kids in. You can actually check them in mobily on your way here. So that's a really cool thing. And there it is, next steps. And as we have equip classes, because the church is here to equip the saints for the work of service, that's what Ephesians 4 says, we have equip classes. There's one coming up this Saturday, by the way, October 3rd. You will find it in that location right there in events. And so you don't have to wonder, when are they going to give me an announcement? You have the announcement. They're also in our version. Go in there, version Bible app. You can find us in the events section, and you can download all of our notes for that week, just like this week, every week, but you want to save them. Tonight, we have a kickoff celebration as well, because once a month, on the fourth weekend of each month, we do a Love Thy Neighbor. Love Thy Neighbor is we, we get with other pastors, other churches in Henderson County, and we just celebrate worship uh, depending on the style of the house. And so we just bounce around like migrants a little bit, and we're, we're worshiping at different churches in Henderson County. Well, this Sunday, today, we're actually hosting at 6 p.m., Pastor Sergio Sinoco from the United Pentecostal International Church is coming to speak, and he said, get the people ready because the Holy Spirit is going to fall in this place, and so I said, well, amen to that, and and so that's going to be tonight. We're leading worship. We have an awesome dynamic of worship that we've added to our team for tonight, and so it's going to be something special. Then another church is actually paying to have a bunch of uh, wings, hot wings, afterwards to give away to everybody. So it's, a, it's going to be a celebration of a night. We are going to make sure you eat today, whether it's outside or after, after tonight. Well, we are in our series called You Are Here, and oftentimes you've seen this symbol, and you've been at a mall or been at Six Flags, and you go and find yourself on a map, and you're not trying to figure out where you are. You're trying to associate yourself with where you want to go. 
So I want you to be mindful of this as you're going through this, this message today, and I show you a graphic here shortly as where are you? I want you to identify where are you, but yet where are you going? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? Because I've, I've been the last two weeks been showing you how you can get there, what all you have to do what to, to, to get there. Today I'm going to show you how to stay God-centered. And so let me show you this graphic. But we've talked about this, this group right here is exploring God. This group right here is becoming, becoming relational with God. They're getting to know Him. We're, right here, these are experiencing God. And then over here, they're God-centered. We want to know what is it going to take to become and stay God-centered. This, this group right here, they discovered, you know what? I, I need to believe in Jesus. Not just confess Jesus as Lord, but I need to believe. This week, I was able to lead a young lady to the Lord. She had been confessing for many years. She had actually been in church for many years, but she would never believed. We talked about that two weeks ago, and I said, do you really believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? He hung on the cross, and for three days he was dead and buried, and he rose again so that you may have life? She goes, no. I said, do you want to? She said, yes. And so I led her through a prayer of salvation. She had been in this group for a long time in church. All of this is a survey of those who have been in, or are in church. Uh, over 180,000 believers took a survey, and this is what was come out, come out of that survey. A mass of questions that divided down into four results. So then they got into relationship. Man, I'm, I'm, I, I understand grace. You know what? I couldn't earn it. It was all just by believing and trusting and receiving the, the beautiful gift that God has given us. Then relationship, moved into discipleship, the understand, understanding, I need God's word. And then the discipleship part, as they grow in discipleship, understanding giving to give my life away. We're not talking about money today, so don't close your hearts. We're not talking about money. But we are talking about giving yourself away for the sake of God. Here's the trick, though. This is not chronological order. You, you can't say, because I've been in church for 30 years, I'm already automatically in lordship. You may, have been, you may have been in church for 30 or 40 years, and you're still right here just beyond the cross. So there's no chrono chronology to this. Because in fact, once you got saved, you actually started right here. Because nothing else mattered in this world the moment you got saved. The only thing that mattered was Jesus is Lord and he's Lord over my life and I yield everything for his causes, his purpose, and who he is and who he says I am. But things happen and you start to settle somewhere else, somewhere right in here. And we're going to talk to you how and tell you how to get back to that lordship and how to keep a God-centered life. Y'all ready? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. So how do we stay God-centered? We talked about this, uh, this parable a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to read the whole thing for your sake. Uh, Luke 8 has a, has a representation of that. We find this same parable in three of the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we find this. We, did, we, we read Mark. We find this in Mark, I'm sorry, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, not in John. So we're reading Luke in Luke 8. 8.15, we're reading what he says about this parable. He says, but the ones that fell on the good ground. I want you to remember this word throughout the day, good ground. It's important because that's the fourth soil. We've talked about the other three groups. Those are three soils. We're talking about the fourth soil, and that is good ground. The ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now, Mark 4 says, in this bear fruit with patience means bear fruit with from some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And that's really what we want. Every time any of you or myself have ever heard that and like, yeah, I want that life where I'm bearing 30 foot, I'm, give, whatever I'm doing, give it, give it to me times 30. Let, me, let it just be maximized. 60. I want the 100-fold. I want everything you have for me, Lord. But yet it's been a, a struggle. It's like, how does this even happen? And, and what happens is in the human side, we want to start working for it and earning it and doing it and laboring, and I can do this with my own hands. But God has another way. 
And I'm going to show you, this is probably the most important message that you'll hear all year long, because I'm going to show you how you can actually let go of your own ways and watch God begin to move you towards, with patience, as he says, move you towards the 30, 60, and 100, and God will begin to bring things into your life. You're saying, well, I've been working for that for years. And all of a sudden, all I had to do was just give up and let him move me towards it. I promise you that. Look at this. Here's the key. Good ground represents a good heart. So the key is, I just have to keep good ground. My heart, good ground. i got to keep this right here, good ground. A good heart. But what constitutes a good heart? I'm going to give you three points, and the first one is this, a humble heart. I've got to keep a humble heart. We've discussed the parable. We've read it. We've discussed the parable, and then we discussed the, applic- the explanation of that But we have not discussed the conversation that took place in Mark 4 or or Matthew or Luke from the time Jesus gave the parable of the sower, the four soils, and then the explanation because the disciples didn't quite yet understand the parable. So let's talk about the conversation that took place before the explanation today. This is Matthew 13, representation, verse 10. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered to them and said, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You need to get that. Because God, Jesus is telling you, it has been given to you to understand and to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not yet, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he who, who, he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, Even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak in parables. Now, he's about to explain why people don't understand parables. You ready? Verse 14 says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. Verse 15, right here, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes, they have closed. God didn't close their eyes. The eyes, their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, spiritual eyes, hear with their ears, their spiritual ears, and lest they should understand with their hearts, and then turn, or It actually means to return back to the Lord so that I can heal them, so that I heal them. And I know many people in this room even need healing. Many of your family members need healing. I mean an inner healing, a soul healing. Some of you need a a physical healing, but we all need at some point and some level some healing and development and growth in our souls so that we can maintain a good ground, a soft heart, and the 30, 60, and 100-fold will just begin to draw near us. Look at this. Isn't that interesting? They said, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus says, because it has been given to you the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not yet been given. And many people make speculation about this, but what the issue is, it's really an issue of the heart. It's an issue of the heart. He says this, hearts, the hearts of this people have grown dull or have grown hard. They were soft, but they have grown to be dull and hard. If you ever have wondered, why, why does so-and-so get so much revelation? Why does, how come this person understands the word so well? And you're thinking, well, I read the word too. I read God's word. Why come that, how's the, that doesn't happen for me? The question is this, what is your heart? What's your heart? Because the the word, he says, is the seed, and the word needs to fall on good ground so that it can bear fruit. So the question comes to, what's your heart? Because the seed is the word, and the heart is the ground, right? If your heart is good ground, then the seed will produce fruit. So all i got to do is keep it good ground. If if my heart is soft and teachable, then the seed is going to penetrate and become and bear fruit. Good ground is a humble heart or a soft heart. Look at Ezekiel 36 and 26. It says this, I will give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit within you. Amen. I will take the heart of stone, because we all start with a heart of stone. We all start there, and sometimes it returns. I will, take, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of stone. The moment you get saved, he just takes that hard heart that you have, and he says, here, I'm going to give you a soft heart so that you can hear me and understand me, and you can understand the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to give this to you so you can walk in God-centered lordship, but... We all start there. Here, 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 just watch this graphic. We all start there. But then what happens? We talked about it last week. The thorns of life. My neighbor is in there saying, get those thorns out of your leg. Get those thorns. And he goes, Tell me about the hogs came through and messed up his yard. And he goes, boy, they just gave me some thorns this week because I, I love a good yard. And so we're just joking about the thorns of life. But really, they signify the issues, the things of life, the cares of this world is what Jesus says. The deceitfulness of riches, they come along. I'm in lordship. God, you're the God of everything. You're amazing. Man, how am I going to pay for this? The deceitfulness of riches and then the desire for other things. Man, I sure would like to have that. Ooh, I don't know how. Man, I, that would be nice to have. The cares of this world, Lord, I just don't know how this world is ever going to change. Well, under lordship, you understood that you are the change. But all of a sudden, it became too much. And what happens? Persecution. Persecution comes along. Tribulation. These are the things. These are the things that took, that destroyed the seed from the soil over time, as Jesus was saying. And so we settle in somewhere around here. Or this, we get saved. Man, we're in lordship. Everything is good. We're like hallelujah all the time. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and our heart gets wounded, and we say, uh-uh. That ain't ever going to happen to me again. Harden. I will never put myself in that situation again. Harden. And the more we make this decision, we harden our hearts, we harden our hearts, and we close our eyes to the mysteries and the understanding of God. Because we've begun to protect and the harder our hearts get, and the harder the ground gets, the more the seed of the word, when it's planted, when it's sown, stays on top of the ground. And Jesus says, the birds of the air come and steal the seed, lest, it, lest we believe, lest it gets into the good soil, the good ground, lest we believe and our lives are changed. And he says, who's the birds of the air? Satan. Satan loves for you to have a hard heart so that you can come and steal the seed, the word, the revelation that God is trying to give you so that you don't change in your life. Your life doesn't change. Your family stays burdened. Your marriage stays destroyed. Your finances are messed up. Your kid's life, your relationship with your kids is all jacked up. He loves that because he wants to steal the word. He wants to bring wounds. He wants your heart to be hardened so that he can do his good work. And keep us in a place of pain. And when you make that decision, you are making a decision to close your spiritual eyes and harden your heart. And you'll read this book and not know the mysteries of this book because your heart has now become hard yet again. These are Jesus' words. Each point, I'm going to break this down, give you some clarity, because each point today comes from Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, 15 says this, For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble heart. Humble spirit, sorry. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. God's saying is, is saying, I dwell in high places with those who are humble. And humble means to go low. Both in the Greek and the Hebrew, when he says to humble yourself, he says to go low, to literally bow yourself before a mighty God, before your Father. To prostrate yourself is the word. So he's saying, whenever you go low, I dwell with you in high places, meaning, well, how can I be in a high place by going low? By going low, God is saying, well, I'm dwelling with you. I'm giving you access to the mysteries of the kingdom of God in his word, in my word, because all you do, all you're doing is going low, and you're saying, I don't have this thing figured out. The way up in the kingdom is down. The high road is the low road. 
It's completely backwards to what we understand and our logical understanding according to culture and the world. This is why he's saying, if you'll humble yourself and prepare yourself to receive the word of God and show up, God will show up and he will begin to raise you up. It's in that raising up that he begins to lift you, draw you, and order your footsteps towards the 30, 60, and 100 fold. Look at this, Psalms 10, 17. It says, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble you will prepare their heart. But what is he preparing their hearts for? To hear and understand the mysteries of his word. Before, uh, before understanding this whole humility thing, I was just saved. I was trying to show through pride that I had it all together. I moved to Austin. I needed change. And I had a new set of friends. And it was a great discipleship uh, culture in the church I was in. And a lot of younger people were much more advanced in understanding the mysteries of God's word, the truth, just, just simple discipleship than I was. And I, I started hanging out with them, and I was, I, was, I was around them. I really wanted to impress them. I wanted, really wanted, didn't want them to know I didn't have my stuff together. I was all jacked up on the inside. So I really held myself well in high, high stature, right? And so I, there, was when, there was that time when those expensive jeans started coming out. Like, in order to get a nice set of jeans, in order to not wear Wranglers and Levi's, you had to spend $150. And so that was, that was that season when that started happening. I remember going to the mall. I was in kind of a hurry. I remember going to the mall, picking up some jeans, and coming home, getting dressed, going off to the restaurant to meet my friends. And I'd already gone into the restaurant, hanging out with them, really keeping myself in order, using my, my silverware wear correctly. And I was really showing out. I mean, I was, I was showing them I am something. And I remember going to the restroom, and I, I, it was that time, I need to go to the restroom, I go to the restroom, and I, I noticed on the rest, in the, on the my way, man, people just were watching me. Man, and the more they watched me, the taller I, my walk got. I mean, my chest got bigger. I was practically walking on stilts or a ladder. I mean, just, just man, they love my jeans. Look at this. They are watching me. I am something. And then I get to, I go to the restroom, and I turn around, I'm washing my hands, about to wash my hands, I see in the mirror that strip down that says the size of your pants, right? <laughs> they weren't looking at me. They were looking at this guy walking through the restaurant with this strip, this a sticker that says the size of his pants. I'm sitting here thinking they're looking at me. See, God doesn't dwell with that, that person. That person's high and lofty. He dwells in high places with people who are going to go low. That's the kind of people that God wants, God wants to dwell with. Do you know why they couldn't understand the mysteries? Because they thought they knew everything. So they couldn't learn anything. I don't even work with people that think they know everything. Uh, uh, if a person is not teachable, I don't want them ruining any and ruining others. Uh, an unteachable and a prideful person will bring that into any environment and they will spread toxicity like crazy. A person like that will never be useful for the kingdom because they already have it all figured out. God can't teach them anything. And they're going to deceive others to think that they've got it figured out. And that's what Jesus is talking about, the blind leading the blind. And so number one is this, the heart, the heart good ground is a humble heart. To keep your heart good ground is to keep it a humble heart. Number two is this, a holy heart. Keep it a holy heart. Now you get to choose. It's a holy heart. Isaiah 57, 15, let's go back there as well. It says, for thus says the, the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in high and holy place. Now, God is holy, no doubt. We can't argue that. But what is holy? The question is, we, the, the issue is we don't understand holy. Is holy perfect? Well, no. Yes, God is perfect, but that would be way too much for us to obtain. Is, is, it, is holy sinless? No, it's, it's not sinless, but, but yet God is sinless. And so what is it? Holy just means set apart. It means set apart in proximity, moved away in proximity. God is saying, be holy, keep your heart holy. I dwell in high, high and holy place. Whose name, he said his name is holy. God is perfect. He is sinless, yes. God the Son was sent to be the bridge for our restoration. Holy does not mean sinless perfection. If it did, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Look at this in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It says, But as he 
who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now if holy means sinless perfection, then we have a verse that says that you and I, you also be perfectly sinless in all of your ways. Well, that feels like a lot of pressure. That's not what this means. Here's what it does mean. It says you also be set apart in your conduct from a lost and sin-filled world. He's talking about the heart. Be set apart in conduct. Remember the, remember the graphic, if you were here last weekend, I was showing you how letting the Bible interpret the Bible, how that works out. And 1 first, first Peter 1, uh, 15 through 16 is actually a quote that comes out of Leviticus. Four times in Leviticus, chapters 11, 19, and twice in 20, you see this term, be holy for I am holy. Look at this in Leviticus 20 and 26. It says, you must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from all the other people to be my very own. This is what he's saying. Be holy. I've set you apart. Be set apart in your heart from the world. Be in the world, but do not let your conduct, your attitude, your behaviors, the meditations of your heart look like that of the world. While you are there, let your heart be set apart so you can understand the mysteries of my kingdom and I can release the mysteries of my kingdom through you, through your conduct, through your heart into a lost and broken world. You get it? Man, thank you. So one person. Wait, this, this, this is funny, though. Matthew, Matthew 15 says, one, well, I'm going to get to a story, but I've got to tell you this. Matthew 15, verse 1 and 2 shows this, shows part of the story. The, the scribes and Pharisees who were far from, Jeru, or were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. I mean, this is kind of funny because Jesus always said they were more concerned about the, tra- the transgression of the traditions, but Jesus would always tell them, your, trans- your traditions transgress the heart of God. It's called religion, and, he, and God's not in it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just touching on hearts. But the funny thing is, most of us, if you've grown up in East Texas, most of you have, have gone fishing at some point. And, and I know growing up with my grandfather who took me fishing almost every week, catfishing, we had, always had some worms. And it was always in some nasty soil. And you break that worm because you just need a piece of worm and you have worm guts all in your fingers and fingernails and finger beds or you're cutting fish bait and you're baiting your hook with this stuff. And if you don't have, if you don't have gunk and nasty guts in your fish bed, I mean in your fingernail beds and your fingernails, you're probably not fishing. What do we do? We bait that hook, we cast it, we set it down for a second, we put our hands in nasty water, lake or pond water, by the way. There is no soap and there's no hand sanitizer. So we, we do that and we wipe them out just like this. I mean, obviously it's clean, yet still gunk and black stuff is in our fingernails and fingernail beds. And then we take our sandwich, our ham sandwich, and then we take another bite before we pick up our rod because I'm going to sit here for a little bit and I'm going to make sure my belly, right? So I'm laughing when he says, well, they don't wash their hands before they eat this bread. Well, no, they're fishermen. They never wash their hands. They certainly, I mean, doesn't matter what they're eating. It's just astonishing to me. Matthew 15, 7, he's still addressing them, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart, it's all about the heart. Their heart is far from me. It's all about the heart. And we can say we believe in Jesus all we want, but what comes out of the heart is really going to show us what we believe about Jesus. Matthew 15, 12 says this, Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you not know, do you, or do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? I can hear Jesus literally saying, I don't care. And it's, <laughs> the reason is, it's usually those who are doing lip service only are the first to get offended. I'm thirsty. <laughs> Jesus' actual response was this. You, start, you stay far away from them. Those are the blind leading the blind. And those people think they have it all figured out and they will release toxicity into your life, into your heart if you hang around them for too long. That's exactly what he said. 
So the disciples still don't get it. Yet, now they were, they were, notice they were talking about food and eating. I'm going to bring you back to that. Ham sandwich, dirty hands, talking about food and eating. Matthew 15, 15, 20 says this. Then Peter answered and said to him, man, you've got to explain this parable to us, Jesus. I'm still not getting it. So Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed from, out, from, out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. Not the fact that you had dirty hands before you ate bread, but it's what's coming out of your heart, out of your mouth, that shows the defilement. For the out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now, they didn't see hand washing as a way of getting rid of germs. This was a tradition. And the Pharisees had even commanded, made this a commandment of God, and that's called a ritual, and God's not in that. God wasn't anywhere near that. It's a matter of the heart is what Jesus was trying to show them, and they had made everything spiritual a thing that they could control, religion, natural. And God's saying, uh-uh, that doesn't bless me. That doesn't bless me. So if you're going to keep your heart good ground, then you're going to have to keep your heart set apart from the world. And what you allow to come into your heart will affect what you hear, how you hear, and how you understand God and His Word. It's what you allow to come in. The heart actually thinks, by the way, the thoughts of the heart are what you have been meditating on in your mind. The, the thoughts that you've been meditating, the thoughts that you allowed in, the things that you've allowed to come in here, and they've ruminated without getting shut down immediately, they begin to trickle down into this place, into your heart, and that's how your heart begins to have thoughts that are of fornication, murders, defilement, everything of the above. And instead of immediately kicking those things out, we allow them to stay. We worry. We find concern. We have fear. We're disgruntled about a situation. We're carrying unforgiveness over an issue. Or a lustful thought comes in and we begin to imagine what if, what it could be. What about this? Man, I, in my hurts and my wounds, I allow those things to ruminate until they become part of the deciding factors, the thought life that goes on right in my heart. But if you drive it out immediately... It just goes on. If you, when that lustful thought comes in, you say, no, my God supplies all of my need according to, my riches, or according to his riches of glory. He's going to take care of all of those things. If when something happens and that root of bitterness wants to rise up because someone transgressed against you, remember, you were in lordship, your heart was soft, but something happened to you and you said, never again is that ever going to happen to me. But instead, if you walk in forgiveness, well, I just forgive them for that. Well, I just bless them. I don't want that stuck to me. I don't want that controlling my life. If in that moment, as that thought wants to ruminate around here, if you just say, nope, your word says to forgive, both in Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. I need to forgive. I need to let it go. I'm going to give it to you, Lord. In that moment, you push it out. It has no place to go. And so if you want to bear good fruit, you're going to have to keep your heart holy. The meditations of your heart are going to have to reflect him and not the thoughts, the concerns of this world, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the distractions that want to come along. And so in those moments, nope, I'm yielding all that back to God. Nope, I'm yielding it all back to God. The Bible is full of mysteries of the kingdom, and your heavenly Father wants to have an intimate, close relationship with you so he can reveal the matters of your heart and begin to bring healing to those through his word, and through his voice. So number two is holy heart. Number three is a heavenly heart. My job is to keep my, good, my ground good, my heart good, soft, and that means I've got to maintain a heavenly heart. Let's look at Isaiah 57, 15 again. It says, For thus says the high and lofty one, that's God, who inhabits eternity. God is an eternal-minded God. 
when he created you, and yes, he created you, he was anticipating this leg of life, this part of eternity, this generation. He was anticipating what would be taking place right now in the world, in culture, and he created a good work, and then he created you, put your name in the blank. Because he is eternally minded. And if we're going to have a heart that is keep kept on eternity and heavenly things, so we're going to have to carry this understanding that says, this is not my world, this is not my home, I am heading home, but this is not it. I, I am heading to a heavenly place, but this is a temporary world, and I am an eternal person. And I've got to have this understanding that this is an eternal book written by an eternal being, a spiritual being. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people. And when I set my mind, my heart, on heavenly things, he begins to give me insight, and I'm not concerned about the matters of this world, but instead I can do the good work which he created for me in advance, Ephesians 2.10. says, he, you are his handyman, his handiwork. His workmanship, you're his masterpiece created, Scripture says, in Christ Jesus for the good work. Well, why am I here? Let me tell you. You are created for the good work which God created beforehand. Let me break that down. God knew this season was going to happen in the world, and he said this is the work that is going to get us through during this leg of eternity. And then he said, I'm going to create Floyd to do this thing. God never said, I'm going to create a Jeff, and then i got to figure out what I'm going to do with him, and so here, let me just make something up. He created the good work, and then he created your name. You put it in the blank, and he said, here, for eternal purposes, I am giving you this responsibility. You've got to figure out what it is so that you can move eternity further. But I don't get that if I have a temporary mindset. If I'm just concerned about the 80 years that I'm going to be here on life, and what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Who's going to pay my bills? How's this going to work out? Who am I going to marry? How, when am I going to marry? How many kids am I going to have? I can't think about eternity whenever that is the ruminations of my mind that gets in my heart and begins to drive me and control all of my decision making. But if you set your mind on temporary things, you will not be able to understand an eternal book. You can't understand, you can't see long distances when you're short-sighted. If you read the Bible with an earthly heart, you can't understand it. But if you read with a heavenly heart, God will open your understanding to the mysteries that He has for you to discover because as he does, it gives you revelation. And this is how he begins to order your footsteps towards the abundance with patience, he says, or the 30, the 60, and the 100 fold. So what I'm saying is, all I got to do is just let it go. All I have to do is keep my heart humble, holy, and on heavenly things. And as I do, he begins to drift me towards those things. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Like, this is so confusing for me. You mean I need to not see what I see and see what I don't see? Yes. How do I do that? There's a reason he wants you to do that. Because he wants you to be able to change the things that you see by living from a place that you don't yet see. And when I begin to put my heart on things of heaven, because that's my home, then I begin to translate the actions and the activities that are going on in this world according to heaven, and my answers are coming from heaven now and not from culture. And certainly not from Facebook. Certainly not from our government. Colossians 3 says this, if then you were raised with Christ, remember, he, he, see, he sits in high places with people who are low in heart, who are humble. And then he's saying in Colossians, if then you are seated with Christ, you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. He's saying meditate. Let the meditations of your mind and your heart be of things or where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father because with a lowly heart and a humble heart and a heavenly-minded heart, you will actually be giving access, understanding to the revelations, as I would say, revelations of the mysteries of God's kingdom 
And now you'll be able to live life while all hell is breaking loose. You'll be at peace, perfect peace, because you know who your provider is. Isn't that what we all need? But right now, and there's COVID funk and this crazy issues of government, everybody's in chaos, tensions are high, people are more fearful than ever, and there was plenty of fear in this world already, and now perfect peace seems like a far-off place, and it's more like when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. But it's not. It's here and now. And those who are heavenly-minded, those who are keeping their heart humble, good ground, and holy, they're walking in perfect peace while the world is all, all hell's breaking loose all around. I'm not afraid of that. Okay, you do that. Okay, you get surrendered by all that stuff that's going on in the government. I'm not afraid of that stuff. I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going, and I know what guides my decision-making. And it's not culture. It's not social media. It's not even my finances, because I live from a place that's right here that shows me another place. He says, set your mind, verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things, not of things on earth. When we set our minds, when we meditate on eternal things, then those thoughts become our heart, and then we can understand this thing when we begin to open it up, and it's like, oh, that's what he meant. Oh, that's, and then the revelation and the inspiration starts to take root. Now, Mark 4 talks about three words that are very, have been very important to us. So I want to remind you, ground, seed, and fruit. Ground, seed, and fruit. I want to show you another passage in Scripture that talk about these three things. Isaiah 55.10 says this, the rain and snow come down from, hev from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. That's the heart, the ground. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Now watch this. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to. And it will prosper everywhere I send it. Do you know how God fulfills his promises in our life? And how the abundance comes along? The word produces the fruit. I just have to keep my heart good. And when that thing happens, I don't say, I'll never put myself in that situation again. I just say, Lord, I forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord, I can't imagine what they're dealing with if they have to treat me like that. I can't imagine what they're going through in their own lives, what torture they've gone through to make them think that they have to treat me like that. Bless their hearts, Lord. You know, in East Texas, we say, bless them. Bless your heart. And that really means you're an idiot, right? <laughs> Y'all didn't know that, and somebody's been saying, bless your heart. Translation right there. And then just bless them back, you know? Bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart. Amen. I, I, don't, I don't have to produce the fruit in my life. All I have to do is keep my heart tender towards the Lord and keep it good ground, and the Lord will sow good seed. He will sow the seed, the word, in my heart, and it will trickle down into my heart, and it will open up the, the fertile places, the soft places, the rough places even, and begin to shine a light in the places he wants to give me revelation. And in doing so, he will change my life, change my mindset, change my heart, and he will begin to bring situations towards me that I've been laboring for and exhausting myself over. And he begins to do it. I keep my heart good. God sends the word. The word does the work. And God's word says he even waters it so that it provides even more growth. Wow. So let me show you another analogy or symbolic or parabolic uh, words that you need to understand. The next verse says, you will live in joy and peace. There it is. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Do you know the trees of the field are? You, that's right, you. Scripture says, Psalms 1, it says, the, the man who meditates on the word is like a tree. Now, it, you've never driven down the road and seen the trees just clapping their hands. I'm so glad you drove by today. 
No. And it's not the lie that, the, that some have said, well, that means whenever the wind is blowing, the trees, the oak trees, or, or the branches are shaking and they're clapping there. No. That's not what it means. God is saying that you're gonna, you're, you are going to be raised up and you are going to begin to clap your hands because you are now able to find joy and peace in your life. And look at verse 13. It says, where once there were thorns. Remember last week, we talked about those thorns. Once where there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Amen to that. Yes. Yes. So I don't have to worry about the, the, word, the, the words being choked out of my life if I keep my heart good, soft. Where once there were thorns in my flesh, cypress trees will grow. Anybody ever been to Lake Caddo or Louisiana Bayou or Florida or Mississippi? What kind of trees grow there? Cypress trees. Why? Because they love water. And what is water? The Holy Spirit, His Word, is our rivers of living water. And you will begin to thrive off of those when you can actually understand them because you kept your heart good. Just keep close. And in 13b, this is what we all want. And we get that revelation. We're staying close. We're, we're being watered by the Word and by God. And we're growing from thorny to strong and cypress tree. And we, we want this thing. It says this in 13b, these events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. Sure, we want to bring honor to the Lord's name. Sure, we do. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. If we just, he's saying if we just do this thing, we keep our heart good and we allow his word to penetrate our hearts and bring revelation and change us, he will not only move us towards the, abund the abundance with patience, the 30, 60, and 100, but we will see the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of a holy God move through us into the lost and the hurting and the wounded that are in this world. We're staying set apart in heart while we're in proximity in physical nature. And here we are ministering to their needs because we have revelation and inspiration and in fact we don't know otherwise because we're set on heavenly things and we're bringing heavenly things into this earthly situation and we're showing the world that things can be different showing them a hope that they don't have we're showing them the power he says his power and his love and love just overcomes us when people, broken people, are before us and we can't help but to love on them because we see who we used to be while we were deceived and our hearts were dull. And compassion fills our souls. And that's when His power, the gifts of the Spirit, begin to lift up and all of a sudden you start to hear things like, where is this coming from? But this might be a word for you. And it breaks them just like that because nobody could have known that except for God. And all I did was stay close to the Father, keep my heart soft, be good soil, humble myself when I want to be prideful, be holy, be set apart in my thinking, not look like the world. Lord, what is it, what is it you say? Here's what I feel, but what do you say? And then, then I just live from there. Isn't that wonderful? This is the most important message you could probably ever hear in your whole life. Because I just knock down all the lies that you've heard of your whole life that you've got to work for, you've got to earn it, you've got to strive it, you've got to do all these things. No. There may, come, there may come some work with it. But all i got to do is allow the Lord to do the work through me. And when I do that, I'm operating in His rest. And He brings me His best. And I'm just laboring with Him in all things. And I don't have to worry about protecting myself. I don't have to worry about security. I don't have to worry about provision because he will supply all of my needs. And he begins to drift me towards the purposes, the calling, the identity, everything that I so badly want that would have choked me out with those thorns. I want to pray for you. Because maybe, just maybe, You've been having some lustful thoughts that have wanted to ruminate in your mind and trickle down into your soul. Maybe, just maybe, you've had some prideful thoughts 
been wrestling with this pride thing and meditating on these things. Maybe, just maybe, someone has done something to you and you're pretty angry about that. Or maybe, just maybe, they didn't do it and you thought they did, but because of the wounds that are in your soul, your heart, you perceived that they did this thing. And Satan has sown in lies and is trying to destroy relationships. I just want to encourage you today to just surrender all those things back to the Lord and say this, Father, I just give those things back up to you. And Father, I, I ask that you turn my hard and dull heart back to a heart of flesh and I don't have to protect myself anymore. I don't have to be the, my own means of provision anymore. You, Lord, you are my provider you are my protector. But Lord, I ask that you just give me revelation and that you help me to understand the mysteries of your word that are going to change my life, my heart, my family's life, the relationship, the broken relationship I have with my children. Help me to see finances from another way because I'm trusting in you. And then do this. Say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Father, I pray for grace upon grace upon grace and empowering grace. And I thank you that your word says that we already have wisdom. And if we feel like we don't, we can ask. And you, being a good father, will provide wisdom for every situation. Thank you, Lord, that we already have peace because the Prince of Peace resides in our hearts. And we can live from a place of peace at our choosing as we choose to soften our heart and the good ground of our heart. Father, I pray for an, a willing heart in every individual to see you through this season of life trying to lay it all down, giving it all up for the sake of your purposes, for the sake of your kingdom, and those who are carrying soul wounds into this place uh, that need inner healing. Father, I just pray that you minister to those needs right now, right where they are. I pray for, I just command freedom right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for physical healing in this place. I pray that those who have come in here with a physical pain, the Lord, your word says that as your soul prospers, I pray that too, your body does too. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.